From the Middle is a founding member of Odd Pods Media. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to episode number 251 of From That Middle. We are three middle-class guys living in the middle of America in the middle chapters of our lives with points of view somewhere in the middle. And we have some questions. What about when bees get in the middle of your weep hole? What do you do there? Uh, we get in the middle of the uh, dinner and supper debate. The middle of the painted lines is a great place to shoot. And down to the middle of some of the stuff that we're watching. Go ahead and check it out and enjoy that intro music. <coughs> Oh, for the love. Sorry, just clearing my Mountain Dew hole. I got my phone hole clean today. That's where you keep it? You're so cerebral, and you're so developed and evolved. I got I got bees in my weep holes. So you know, you know how your window good. Yeah, you know how your windows in your house have sometimes a little hole at the very bottom so that when the rain hits the pane and flows down and then goes into the little groove at the bottom, it can weep outside instead of collecting. Yeah. Well, the bees are coming in from the outside. Oh. You know, into the weep your, holes. Your weep holes sound like they're too big. My weep holes are too big. How do you how do you better defend your weep holes? How do you keep the bees out and the water flowing where it's supposed to? Is exactly what I asked Google and I found these. Little adhesive screens. Yeah, makes sense. That let the water flow outward and keep the bees from coming inward. They've thought of everything. That's exactly what I wanted to say. Just when you think I've got a situation that no one has an answer to. Because I was like, I could just caulk it. But you don't want to caulk it because then the water can't get out. You can't put a caulk in your weep hole. No, you wouldn't so, want to do that. So anyway, hey, guys, uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, you might notice that it's a different time of day for us. That's right. Rather than not do an episode this week, we said, hey, let's try to find a different time that works for us because we didn't want to upset that one listener. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, thanks for joining. How are you guys doing? How are, your, I, how are your weepholes? So far, so good. I uh, station little stormtroopers at them just to just to keep the bees away. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. They're yeah. a terrible, they're a terrible shot, but at least there's some, some movement, you know? Yeah. I stand the kids outside of the weep holes that way they can mm -hmm. fight off any, any pests that might try to come in. So yeah. it's a full-time job for them, but. What's been hilarious, uh, back to the, the weep hole situation after I applied said screens, the bees kept coming to try to get back in. They're so confused mm -hmm. and they were, I saw one bee. I have video of this. He's trying to pull back. <laughs> Uh -huh. Pull back the sticker, uh, and so I just swat them. Yeah, while they're Don't trying to finagle their way back in. Anyway, so they're so they're so frustrated, uh, they become weeping weep holes <laughs> because they're so sad that they can't get back in. Is it true mm. that if you kill a bee, it's only going to attract more? I've heard that like if you kill one, it like emits a scent, and then all the others come and. Like or zombies, I maybe. Uh, yeah, I think so. Like zombies. Anyway, <laughs> I've never, never. I don't heard think that. that's the thing. Okay. Hey, well, so screens for for those who might not know. There's a uh, a YouTuber. I don't know. I forget the guy's name. The name of the channel is uh, Lost in the Pond, and it's a it's a British guy who has uh, um, immigrated to America. And he posts videos of things, oftentimes just things that are different between Great Britain and here. And one, one of, of the, our favorite things to discuss. Exactly. Love, love those things. And there are some things he's, there it is. There he is, lost in the pond. Um, a lot of the things are sort of a, a bent toward America's crazy. A lot of things are bent toward England is crazy. So he's a, 
he's a pretty good middle ground when it comes to that sort of thing. But window screens, one of the things that uh, that he's like, why why doesn't everywhere in the world have window screens? I don't understand why America has the pigeonhole on the innovation of putting screens outside of your windows. But apparently they don't do that over in, in England. They just deal with the pests. You'd think that any country that already has like netting over beds would mm-hmm. have figured out like, hey, maybe we don't need this over the whole bed. Maybe, maybe we, we just need, need to keep them out of the, the house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, Uber interesting is the other fact that like there's very little air conditioning over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, homes typically don't have it and only some commercial businesses have it. And so, like, they have their windows open a lot. More often, yeah. You More often, think. and no screens. I remember when our friend over at Grief Burrito, Jordan, was uh, remodeling part of his house, and him and I were chatting on the phone once, and he's like, tell me about drywall. Like, the concept of drywall blew his mind, because they mm. just plaster everything. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, we have these sheets. They're, like, four foot by eight foot, and it's, like, chalk, basically, with paper on two sides and you slap that up uh tape your seam and then paint over it and he's like wow (laughs) he's like well how do you like nail stuff and i'm like oh we put studs up first and like it was just you know a lot of older buildings a lot of brick a lot of plaster plaster or lathen plaster anyway yeah that's fascinating i'm gonna deep dive that uh youtube yeah see we can't use plaster because it like cracks a lot of a lot of um electricians or people that install audio video stuff don't don't like dealing with plaster because they don't want to mess up more you know they don't want more of the plaster cracking than it turns into this crumbly mess and it gets worse and worse if you don't fix it properly and right the big pain first drywall you literally just saw out a little section that you need Mm -hmm. and And then put back whatever you need like yeah crazy Speaking of things that are different between cultures and perhaps different between generations, I want each of you separately to finish this series of things. Meals of the day. Ready? Dylan, you go first. Breakfast. What comes next? Second breakfast. Say second lunch. breakfast. Huh? Uh, sorry. Lunch. Yeah. Dinner. Dinner. Okay. Kendall, same? Yeah. Used to be. Back home with my grandparents, when I said that, they'd say, oh, I thought when you said dinner, I thought you meant lunch. Because dinner was supper. And then my parents, Dylan and I's parents used to not correct them, but go, they mean they would like translate. No, grandma, when grandma says dinner, she means lunch. And they used to translate. And my whole lives, I'm going to be 40 in August. My whole lives, my parents sided with us on this. Mm -hmm. Recently, both parents, who both biological parents who live separately now have started saying, because when making plans and I said dinner and they're like, you mean lunch? No, no. No, both have started doing this. I think they've now hit a threshold age. Wait, where they've started to adopt what their parents used to do, they're now doing. Do you wow. think it was a conscious choice? Or do you think like there was like a short in their brain and it was like, and then like that one? I think play. it was that one. So, so mom was trying to come over yesterday before going to your house. Yeah. And she said, What time are you leaving? And I said, I don't have plans until dinner. And she goes, No, but so what time are you leaving? I'm like, 5 30. She's like, Oh, I thought you meant lunch. And then dad did it a couple weeks ago. He called, he, he, he was confusing. And I'm like, wait a minute. We all agreed. We all agreed for 39 years that, that our grand, that your parents, my grandparents were old timey. So I'm wondering, is this like a, you hit a certain age thing or is this a regional thing? Like in the country, Northwest Ohio farmer community, I need to know, I need to hear from the middlers on this one. It's breakfast, lunch, and then what? Or breakfast, what, and then what? And then what's your take on is this age or regional? Now, I yeah. could get on board 
with the number of meals that uh, hobbits have purely because of the frequency. So if we want to do like second breakfast and 11 Z's and dinner and supper, because I think they include both. Um, but we also have an aunt who would, who would still say supper and she would say red up for supper. Meaning red up, red up like get ready for Oh, dinner. wow. Okay. Like red up, ready up for supper or for dinner or whatever's happening next. Interesting. So that I don't know how Midwestern that is, but it feels Midwestern. Like I, I feel like I feel like growing up. Now I haven't heard anybody seriously use the word supper in a long time. I feel like, but when I was younger, I feel like supper and dinner were used synonymously, but lunch was still lunch. So I just pulled this up. Yeah, and it says supper. Here's the bullets under supper: a light meal served late evening. It's informal, it's at home, and it's an evening meal only when dinner, in quotes, is taken at midday. Dinner, then, here's its bullets. It's a main meal, usually served in the evening, can be more formal at home or at a restaurant, and is universally used term for both evening meals. So they're saying you could still possibly have a lunch or if you skipped lunch and it's say 3 34 o'clock you would have dinner this is not nice. then a late supper why would we why why are we reintroducing supper back into things it felt like we could put this in the past with like china cabinets and coffee tables like it's even them. we don't need them it's it's less about zombifying supper and more about why my parents separately have started switching back and then my, uh, we love our dad. We celebrated episode 250. Uh, we talk about the fact that that this all was born out of a conversation between Dylan, he and I at an old bag of nails pub in Gehanna over almost five years ago. And this is another thing they've started doing. The hard vowel sound on the end of the days of the week. Do you want to meet on Tuesday? What? You've never done that before. You're just doing it all of a sudden. What's happening? What? <laughs> is it, do you guys normally record on Monday or is that a Tuesday thing that you, whoa. <laughs> For it's supper? <laughs> That's so interesting. What's happening, you guys? I have to know. I love you all. Anyway. Speaking of, you'd be proud. We, uh, our mom came over and made dinner for what was a belated birthday meal. Was it dinner? <laughs> It was dinner, okay. uh, dinner as I would call it, which is the meal in the evening. And uh, she had asked a few weeks back, hey, like, what do you like, you know, dinner, which is inevitably the same favorite stuff that was from our childhood that she made, because anything newer I can make or we go by. So I had her make her version of lasagna uh, and fruit pizza, which if you're unfamiliar with fruit pizza, it's just like basically a sugar cookie layer. And then a cream, uh, like a, a, it's not an icing. It's cream like a, cheese, powdered it's sugar, like a cream cheese vanilla based extract. kind of thing. Yeah. Cheese layer, and then slices of. Uh, you can do any fruit, but we always just did strawberries. And uh, so we had that, and uh, you'd be proud. In in always finding great ways to reuse leftover food, which we're very proud of here and in the Midwest. I decided to take a knife from that pan of lasagna and cut long, blo a, a long block-like chunk of lasagna. Uh, and then I heated it up and then I dropped it in a tortilla <laughs> and rolled it up for lunch today and had a nice little lasagna tortilla. Uh, so, taco. so did you, did you have it horizontally is what you're saying? So it was like an inch by an inch by like, 10 inches like a little block like somebody would cut mm -hmm. a long block of cheese which <laughs> basically is what it was right yeah so, dude i love then, it and heated that up and just dropped it down in a taco and then rolled up the shell and ate it and it was awesome it was <laughs> so good uh and then had a little fruit pizza for dessert so i'm riding high 
uh, on a very Garfield the cat type lunch, which was just heavy and delicious. You're anti vertical foods today. You all you're all about the horizontal foods. <laughs> Even my daughter has picked up on like dad makes everything a sandwich. <laughs> Uh, and that has just <laughs> story of my life. Everything can be a sandwich if you believe in it. Um, and awesome. so here, so it was delicious. You'd be very jealous. And if you want a lasagna taco, you're welcome. Both, you're both welcome to come over later uh, for have more we, tacos. Have we discussed the dichotomy of sandwiches versus tacos? We can we can talk about that. I don't know that we have. Make, if you want, I feel like it's something we would have talked about by now. Is a taco and sandwich? It doesn't feel like we have. I feel like we should go there now that we've titillated the listener. Mm. I think we need input because this is. I'm sure that this is a battle going on online. We know there's a podcast that is called "A Hot Dog Is a Sandwich." And so there's another one to think about, and I think we have discussed that one before. Yeah, we've point. talked about that one. Also, is cereal soup? Right. <laughs> yeah. But a taco, is a taco a sandwich? What are you, what are you guys' thoughts? No. no, no, no. Taco's not a sandwich. Taco is a taco. If I, I, as a food lover, I'm very much in the camp on all of these. Of I'm not going to get hung up on the nitty gritty because I don't think it matters. So, like, if you want to think of a hot dog as a sandwich because that you just you want to, then that's fine. I have no problem with it. Oh, we have no room for that kind of talk, Dylan. <laughs> it's so it's so close. Because if I took that same hot dog bun and I took that hot dog and I sliced it into little strips like lunch meat, and then I laid the strips on the bun instead of a round hot dog mm-hmm. and put a little bit of a slice of cheese on it, it's almost the exact same thing. But now it feels like a sandwich because it's on a hot dog bun and it's sliced. Right. So we're so close. But because a hot dog is round, it's not. It's not considered a sandwich. A taco is not a sandwich. If you said a taco was a Mexican sandwich, I would say, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, hmm. But is it a sandwich, as we would just straight up call it? No, but I don't. But care. Mexico has, I forget what it's called. There's something that Mexico has that is that is like a sandwich, but they call it something else. I think it starts with a T. Yeah, that wasn't what I was going to say. Doesn't matter if we if you said that to me and you were or were not Mexican it wouldn't matter I would buy it like that's okay. a nickname like that would be a nickname that they would have like oh we call us a Mexican sandwich so what if you take like Great. four hot dogs and lay them across just plain white bread and then put a bread lid on it did you now make a hot dog sandwich I guess it is a hot dog sandwich now because it's hot dogs in it and it's on sliced bread I've yeah. got a- I've got no problem with it. Okay. I just want to, maybe this will help. Maybe we should make them all for me to eat and any combination. And then I'll sit down and eat them all. And then I'll give my opinion after I've eaten them. all. I think that's probably the best answer. I have to taste it first. Well, we taste it. (laughs) And if it, and if it has the spirit and the essence of a sandwich, then maybe I'll allow it, but I I should really try to eat it first. I was going to say, still going to eat it. Don't care what you call it. Uh, Don't care what you call it. Also, uh, I was watching Irish people try the other day and they were having, uh, it's a YouTube channel. Lots of fun. They were having American style hot dogs. And one of the first Irish people said, American says who? And then one of the producers says, good point, because this is from an Irish restaurant that's giving their take on American style hot dogs. And mm-hmm. I don't really care. I, I would have tried any of them were I there. But the reason I said that was because the very first hot dog they had them try had ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise. And I said, that's not, if anything, I don't really give a crap what condiments people put on hot dogs. But if anything, and people are being very picky, in my mind, if you said, what's a traditional hot dog, I'm going to think bun, hot dog, only mustard. Not because that's my preference, but because that's what I think of when I think of the most traditional Plain hot dog that's not actually plain. Sure. Ketchup is fine. Mayonnaise is fine. Don't care if any of it's on there. But I would start with just mustard, then add ketchup if I'm building what I think people think is a traditional American hot dog. Yeah, I'm with you there. I feel like the moment you add mayonnaise to it, you've you've made a European version of an American thing. What they it's think- almost like they're like, well, of course you start with mayonnaise. The Americans I hear also do ketchup and mustard. 
And they love peanut butter, so shove some Reese's in it. You know, oh boy. <laughs> so, oh boy. So going <laughs> back, <laughs> so so this is actually hilarious. So I just typed in: is a hot dog a sand or is a taco a sandwich or are hot dog sandwiches? Then there's this comic: gr- classic sandwiches: grilled cheese, Reuben, PBJ, <laughs> and hot dog. Am I a sandwich? <laughs> so then New York says yes, and it says why New York Department of Taxation and Finance officially listed hot dogs and sausages on buns and rolls, etc. That's, et cetera, that's, pretty, official. that's wow, pretty official. That's the largest city in the United States saying that in, in that state saying it's a sandwich. Also on that list where gyros are a sandwich and also yep. that uh, wraps are a sandwich. And then Katie Bratt on Twitter said... Okay, listen, the sandwich discourse is played out. We need to have a new discussion. Pop tarts are a kind of ravioli. <laughs> mm. So then the wars began, blah, blah, blah. And then this alignment chart come, comes out. So on the X axis, that's the vertical one, right? I always forget. Uh, is whether or not you're a structure purist, neutral, or rebel. And then on the the the, the Y axis, then, is the ingredient purist, <laughs> neutral, or rebel. And then what you get in each... A uh, section of the matrix. <laughs> oh, I'm a fan of whoever whoever put the work into putting this together. So this, I, it, this is beautiful. What's interesting though is it really, for me, as soon as it, you guys you should definitely be following us on YouTube for this. To me, the ingredient purist makes more sense of where they're getting it wrong than the structure purist. If you go, if I go down the left column. All of those, if you made an argument like a chicken wrap as a sandwich, I could, I, I, uh, okay. But as soon as they start start showing ice cream with chocolate chips and waffles, now all of a sudden it's like, no, you're in dessert. <laughs> you're Choco serving. taco. Yeah. Choco sandwich. taco. Oh, that's hilarious. The the ravioli question is easy. That that very simply becomes a pop tart is not ravioli and vice versa the structural integrity, the temperature and the flavor our profiles are all totally opposite on those. Yeah. So, so notice from the top left, the far bottom, right, the terms are given. So you're a hardline traditionalist if you're top left. And then if you're a pop tart as a sandwich camp, you're a radical sandwich anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We need, uh, we need our friends over at, uh, uh, grab them in the brisket to weigh in. Um, they surely have some thoughts on this. What if you put brisket in a gyro or in a taco? Is that still, or is it, because mm. they're very close to authentic Mexican food, unlike us. So they might have a whole other opinion on tacos and wraps and gyros, um, where they would probably say how very Northern uh, of us to to pull a New York state um ruling on what's a sandwich or not sure that's very a mexican, a mexican sandwich by the way is called a torta yeah that's what it is i need a picture what's a picture what's a torta okay go ahead kendall i'll pull that up yeah you're good um i wonder if the grief burrito boys consider themselves a sandwich <laughs> that's awesome torta. somebody needs to ask that i had a torta Re- when i say recently i mean like within the last year i had one for lunch from a local establishment yeah that's a sandwich torta yeah. de carnitas or carne asada yeah so so mexico has a sandwich thing that's mexican a- flavors and things in it great for the non-youtubers the torta pretty much just looks like a round bun i'm sure there's several technical differences between a, a regular american plain bun and that but it just looks like a regular bun. It's very similar to the kind of bun that they use for like a for like a traditional Cuban. Yeah, mm. the flatter breads. Well, this feels like a great spot for you to go off and think about your thoughts on all of this because it's really think important. About what you did. <laughs> think about <laughs> what you've done. Stand in that corner, young lady, and think about what you've done. Come back, and we need you to weigh in on your thoughts on the matter. We'll be right back after we hear some friends. Here's some friends. Here from our friends in On Pods Media. Be real. Hey, this is Grab and Brisket Podcast. Join us every Monday where we talk about the latest trends in barbecue, interviews with world top pit masters, celebrity cooks. Ooh, like uh, Wee Man from Jackass. And musicians. Like Rich O'Toole? 
So check us out. We do beer reviews, barbecue fails. So many fires. Dude, a lot of people just burn their houses down for no reason. We also talk about cocaine hippos versus Beth Gators. Learn how to make some tailgate gravy. Altercations with Texas Rangers. People throwing Reese's peanut butter cups. Yeah. So check out grabthebrisket.com for podcast info, viral social media posts, and so much more. Do you guys... This isn't going to be a talk about the psychology of parenting styles. Do you guys use timeout? Have you ever used timeout with your kids? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you ever forgotten that you put a kid in timeout? <laughs> yes. 100%. You, you almost got an actual spit take. I, I saw that. <laughs> if there had been more drink in my mouth hole, uh, that you would have, it would have been all over my MacBook. There is, I, I'm convinced that there are few <laughs> feelings in the world that makes a good parent feel like an awful parent to realize that they forgot a kid in timeout. Because in, in our house, like they've been taught, you don't talk in timeout. You don't ask if your timeout's over. Because when you do that, I'm adding another few minutes in my head. I'm not actually using a timer, which is the problem. Because there are times. <laughs> yeah. Turns out we should have been using a timer. Use a timer. Would have been handy for all parties involved. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, there's been a couple times I've had kids in timeout, not for like hours on end, but for far longer than I intended. And including today, we got home from uh, uh, me picking the kids up at school, and one of them was acting up in the car. And I told him to go to timeout when we get home. And so we get home and like I get a phone call. And so I'm like in the garage talking to a, a contractor for something. And and then like I start preloading some chairs into the van for a baseball game that we have later on today and those sorts of things. I'm doing this stuff. And then eventually I come inside and I go into the kitchen and there's one of my kids standing in timeout still. I'm like, oh, dude. All right. I hope I hope you learned something your time. <laughs> I was gonna say, did you did you play it off like, hey man, sometimes mommies and daddies make make mistakes. And today's mistake is that well, I forgot listen, you were here. <laughs> I firmly believe in being honest with your kids <laughs> in those kinds of situations. This one wasn't as egregious as some that had been. Sure. Um, where I have said, I'm gonna be honest, I forgot about you. So, um, you know, and that doesn't help with your middle child syndrome, but I, I did forget. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't have forgotten about your older sibling. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely forgot about you. And your younger sibling has never been to timeout. So <laughs> exactly. it's like, I'm pretty sure I could hear my siblings watch an entire Disney movie in the amount of time I was in timeout. <laughs> How long um, were you in timeout, buddy? One whole Pocahontas, one whole Pocahontas. Yeah. Can I propose uh, a fun new uh, play on that game where a child earns a get out of a uh, timeout free pass when you accidentally oh. leave them in? And it would be a fun way when it happens, you can say, You did such a good job in timeout this time that I'm going to give you one free get out of timeout pass that you can use at any time. I uh, freaking love that idea and wish I had younger kids again to be able to use it. That's awesome. Just start putting your teenagers back in timeout. And then you can, <laughs> yeah. You like, can Dad, what you, 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 you go to timeout, Dad. I'm not and, <laughs> and then see how they use it. Note, make sure to write down who's earned how many passes. Second, maybe start using a timer. And then they won't earn extras. But that would be fun. You should try that. Would also create really thoughtful Monopoly players. <laughs> so yes. Yes, there's that. I really like that idea. I'm not sure what it teaches long term. You can buy your way out of things. Well, no, it's like preventative you maintenance. It's a you lesson in so preventative. Well, yeah. You did so well with the punishment that you were given. And you waited so long, so patiently. You can actually earn back extra things you were never expecting you mm. you can you can build up goodwill mm. sure sure so sure. go above and beyond yeah and maybe on occasion you'll earn back a little extra something or along Corey's veins maybe linking the two as you teach your kids the truth which is listen you can choose to follow all the rules and not get in trouble and you'll be fine or 
you can gather and hoard a bunch of resources and cash <laughs> and then you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Either Capitalism. way. Either Capitalism. way. They're learning about life. Speaking of uh, parenting failures and wins, um, I drop the ball regularly with parenting, but every once in a while I do something kind of fun. And I texted you guys pictures of this. We have a, a basketball hoop in our driveway. Uh, our previous owners poured a pad in addition to the two quote unquote lanes that lead into the garage. So there's almost, you could, you could park three cars wide facing our house. So we've got an extra big concrete driveway. It's on a hill, which makes this next part kind of crummy. But anyway, I painted lines on the driveway that are high school, Ohio State High School, High School Athletic Association. I can't talk today. Uh, girls high school basketball distances for everything. So I did the key and the top of the key and the three point line. And I think the boys high school boys is like just four inches or so beyond mm -hmm. the high school girls line uh, i painted it on the driveway i'll share pictures to our from the middle for the middlers youtube group if you're not a part of that that's where we post our extra content as though it were a patreon we kind of treat it like a paywall but it's not you just get extra behind the scenes stuff of us idiots but it was really cool the kids are loving it and it's drawing all the neighborhood kids around and now they're now they're playing knockout from the lily had been shooting free throws a lot further back than than that was actually required. Then she has to, Good and it's her. funny. There's just a touch of landscaping that comes out at at the side of the house and sort of cuts off the three point line. And my buddy came over and he's like, "Dude, your daughter's gonna have an awesome three point shot from everywhere except for that one spot where you didn't <laughs> paint the line because there's landscaping right there." But it was pretty fun. And I, Kendall, I loved your response. You said, "My ten year old self is very excited." It's just oh, a fun little thing that. It might be a pain to go to remove one day with a pressure washer or something, but I was like, what the heck? You only live once, right? Why are you ever going to have to remove it? Like it's yeah. Yeah. there for the next. I people. mean, if you have if you have like a three, four bedroom house. Any, when you try to sell the house, they are people who have kids or are planning on having kids. And they're going to love that. The fact that there's that there's a basketball court in the driveway. Thank you. I appreciate that. My. Next thought was like, how far do I take this? Like, do I paint in the whole key with another color and then do oh, the yeah. Jordan thing? And like, how Dude, far it's you? How, how far? Lighting, yes. Grandstands, speakers, <laughs> all of it. I think, yeah, for, for one thing, I, my comment was more toward you're like the artsy painter kind of guy. And so I'm like, don't just do like a solid color, like make a design and put it in the key. Oh, yeah, in, for sure. And yeah. Or make a sunset where the top of the key is is the sun and then and then fading to the hoop or something like that. Like that. Nice. Cool. Something like that. But then also to Dylan's point, you're the all in kind of guy. Nothing's worth doing. Anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> and so <laughs> it sounds like you're really only just getting started. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all you did was open a can of worms for yourself. Thanks, guys. I, I appreciate it, the support. 10 year old me is going to be over at your house three times a week to play basketball. Uh, I'll bring those, I'll bring lasagna tacos. And uh, is a can of beans a sandwich? Is, is a lasagna just a multi layered sandwich? It's like a Big Mac kind of thing. It's like a wet that, torta. Um, <laughs> that's just a Mexican sandwich. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm getting confused now. Well, yeah. speaking of doing things and doing them right or doing them too much, I talked in a previous episode about how. When someone I subscribe to likes things, I go and explore those things as well. So Connor Tomlinson from Love on the Spectrum, we've talked about it enough. You don't need to hear me rehash it. We've titled some of our episodes with his name, so you know which ones to go and listen to. He loves a show on the BBC that is no longer running, but started in 2002 and ran until 18 or 19 called Still Game. And he wouldn't stop talking about this show. He quotes the show. So... I have started watching Still Game. This leads into our uh, what we're streaming segment. So Still Game is a long running Scottish sitcom set in the fictional area of Craig Lang in Glasgow and featuring characters from another show called Chewing the Fat. The show began in theater before moving to radio and television and proved so popular among its Scottish audience that it was broadcast nationally as of the fourth season. 
and it follows evergreen pensioners, that's retirees from the uninitiated and lifelong best friends, Jack and Victor, as the pair get up to mischief, trying to familiarize themselves with contemporary gadgets and culture and cope with the trials and tribulations of modern life. So again, it ran from 2002 to 2019. So funny, you know, when you find those obscure British sitcoms that you're just like, how am I just now hearing about this? Or why wasn't there an American version of this show? It's so funny. I remember Dylan telling me about the IT crowd, uh, things like that. So these guys are much younger than the characters that they portray. I think they're in their uh, probably 30s or 40s when they're filming the show, but they play these retirees. You will need subtitles because the Scottish accent is so thick <laughs> that it's really, really, really hard to make out all of the words. I was getting close, but I was missing what I felt was a few keywords. Mm. Just a really fun comedy. If you're in the mood for like a, a lesser known popular BBC show, uh, definitely check out S Still Game. And Connor, thanks for the recommendation. What are you guys watching? And where do you uh, find that show? That is on Netflix. Sweet. Uh, so I just watched a uh, documentary on also on Netflix. It's called Hans Zimmer Hollywood Rebel. Uh, and really interesting. It was only about an hour long. If you're into that kind of thing. So if you listen to a lot of music scores or you like documentaries in general, uh, Hans Zimmer is kind of an interesting guy. But I'll share the one thing that I thought was um, really fascinating uh, as far as how he was working over his career, how much it changed. So early on, he he just ha kind of happened to be starting out and creating music right with all the computers and synthetic stuff that was coming up. So that's he had that kind of start, which you can clearly still hear the influence of today, but started out working in a traditional studio and kind of doing a variety of things, working with other composers. But on the tail end of his career, he had done a lot with Christopher Nolan and one of the more recent movies interstellar. Um, they tell the story of basically uh, he didn't even want to Hans Zimmer didn't even want to know what the movie was about. He wanted Christopher Nolan to just basically give him the emotions of the movie. Wow. And, and, uh, and, and write it, write it out. And then he had like a day to work on it. Uh, to to get like the main I like feel of the like the score that they would use, and it ended up being Interstellar score, which hmm. is like one of the that theme from Interstellar. Like the main theme has probably been one of the most popular movie themes in the last five or ten years. I don't know how long it's been out, um, but just crazy. And then. He really young, he was in a band and now he's like kind of back circled back to being like going on tour and playing his own music because he's just kind of having fun doing that. So it's just it's interesting because it doesn't feel like he took a normal path to get from where he was to where he is. And uh, there's some interesting stories about him taking over for the first um, Pirates of the Caribbean movie that lost its composer with like three months left of them working on the movie. So if you're into that kind of thing, check it out. Shogun. Fantastic. Uh, 10 episode series. Definitely check that out on FX or, or FX shotgun or shotgun FX on Hulu, <laughs> which is also on Disney plus. If you partner your Disney plus and Hulu, um, I'm sure there's more I'm watching uh, as of when this comes out, it'll be May the first. So hopefully for May the fourth weekend, maybe people will get in a little, little bit of star Wars. Mm -hmm. And enjoy uh, May the Fourth weekend. But uh, those are some of the big, most recent things. Was Hans Zimmer and Shotgun? Definitely check out Shotgun. Very good. Kendall, um, are you watching anything, or are you just parenting? Well, I mean, I I was going to say, you know, I'm, I'm watching baseball games, um, right now, uh, nine year old baseball games, which is which is fun. You have to love the game of baseball to have fun at a nine ten year old baseball game because it's it's the first year of kid pitch which means that you know long innings lots of walks uh that's that sort of thing no i am watching a little bit so um speaking of watching things based on other people's recommendations dylan i watched uh i'm almost through masters of the air 
and yeah. I, I'm I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm almost I'm I'm almost through it. I've stuck I've stuck with it. Um, I feel like it's slowing down a little bit toward the end, which is probably natural because of the way the story goes. Mm-hmm. Um, um, when you think of of World War II, you don't think of the fact that like if you're going to follow uh, a documentary ish, it's not a documentary, it's a drama series based on a real a real squadron but um the the way that we like to watch things is we like to follow character development and uh you know a lot of people die (laughs) so yeah that's a problem to try to make a long series where you're following people i that was one of those things that i keep reflecting back on when i think of that series is it's so hard to develop characters when you're in a situation where this air battalion has like the highest turnover rate and death of like any any squadron and so you can't follow people because they're constantly dying and replacing them and so it is it's crazy as that sounds and so they made an effort with a handful of characters that they could Mm -hmm. you know that that survive but is that why dad's criticism and i haven't watched it but dad's criticism was that it was just far too much time in the officers quarters is that why because they're the only people surviving yeah because it doesn't start that way it starts every episode it starts there's a big air battle um for the first handful of episodes and then those air battles start to slow down i think one thing that makes it challenging because i was talking to brie about this is that air battles are different than some other things because um when it comes to air battles like everyone's got helmets on a lot of them have helmet their hats and masks and their faces start to become indistinguishable in, in a way from others and so you almost even though there there's they might be bouncing between three, four, five, six, seven planes. It almost just feels like you're showing the same people over and over. And I think that makes it hard where when you can show things kind of slow down and then the officer's quarters or show them back on, on solid ground, you get to see more of them emoting and you get to see their hair and their, their mouths and their, you know, and that doesn't sound important, but when you're bouncing around from cockpit to cockpit to cockpit, it just starts to all look the same in the cockpit. And so I understand the desire um, because I would want to err on the side of more action. Um, but then I think about having watched like um, Dunkirk. Dunkirk almost went the other way. As much as I enjoyed the movie, there was so little, almost nothing felt slowed down and almost the whole thing was tense. And then you didn't even feel like you were relaxing for the three hours of the movie. You just felt tense the whole time. So um, I don't know. It could be a combination of it could be something that has nothing to do with that. It, it it probably isn't anything to do with that. But that was just something that I was thinking about watching over and over. It's like I can't even tell these people apart. So it makes it hard for me to appreciate the dialogue when I don't even really know who's talking half the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just it probably, shared a, I just shared probably a had more to do with like a VFX budget. And then yeah. you know, like we can't we can't pay for tons of air battles. So I just, sorry. I just showed a picture and I think from Top Gun, and I think that's where they got it right. Not saying that that's why they did that, because fighter pilots definitely have, but literally putting a unique graphic and their name across the front for every one of those dogfighting scenes was like, oh, what a clever mechanism to use during filming so that you know who you're listening to who's or who's who? going, yeah. he's behind us. Yeah, and and then people die, and you're not sure who d- has died until they land again, because you're just kind of waiting to see, you know, who actually made it back. But well, good. I'm glad you're enjoying the series. I thought it was very well done. Uh, it's it's good. I didn't hear it to see a ton of like social media posting about it from friends and um, people that I know that are into that kind of thing. So I don't know how well it was received overall. But um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Good. And then. Also, uh, with WWE, I mentioned last week that there was I came close to to heading to Monday Night Raw, which was in town here, and I was thinking about taking my boys with me to that. We ended up not going, and I just recently started to catch up, and so I was starting with that one, that one I hadn't watched yet. And the good and bad bad is that one of my favorite wrestlers is the man Becky Lynch and she she won the the women's world championship belt in Columbus 
on Monday Night Raw in a battle royale. And uh, I missed that. And that uh, I would have absolutely loved to have been there for that. But the other thing, my boys really dig the Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns storyline. And we're just, I mean, we're within the first couple weeks out from WrestleMania. And so even though Cody Rhodes is a smack Friday night SmackDown guy, not a raw guy, they still have those, you know, they're still fleshing out the story, sort of like the end of the stories of WrestleMania on both raw and SmackDown. And so there's a good chance that you'll see him come out and, and do a monologue, but there was no Cody Rhodes appearance. So I was glad that, that, but the boys and I, didn't miss that or Roman Reigns or any of the other big guys. Um, but uh, I was really sad to miss the Becky Lynch thing. That's a that would have been a blast. Uh, speaking of missing live events, uh, Teddy Swims is coming to Columbus. And apparently oh. his show at Kemba Live sold out in four minutes. And they're wow. thinking a lot of it was bots like that just resell. How, right. This is like the Nike sneakers drop thing. Like, how do you get around this? This is not right. What's I don't understand ticketing to live venues and don't un, try to understand like show promotion and how it all works. But that doesn't seem fair. It doesn't. It's annoying. I used to work for a ticketing company. Um, and we would. There was nothing we could legally do about about resellers, people who would send bots and then put them up for sale on on whatever third party um, the secondhand ticket site you can name. But we would go around to the popular ones like StubHub and that kind of thing. And we would right, look right. up the shows that we were selling for. And and we would just we literally had a database that we put together for every single ticket that was sold on StubHub and those kinds of things. And then we would put those on a blacklist that Mm. if somebody, because a lot of times those people, if they can't sell, because if the show doesn't sell out, if the seats don't sell out, then you've got some of these people with the bots who are stuck holding tickets. Yep. And they will try to get refunds for those. And we put them on a database. And if uh, somebody calls in to try to get a refund and they're on that database, absolute no go. Zero refunds for you. Good. So. Blacklist them. Do you think I, other other much more uh, smart industry experienced people have already tried to work through this? But it seems like when you buy tickets, if you just had to put a name on them, on the tickets, and then the tickets came printed, either that you, you put in your wallet app or your name was on the printed thing from off your print, your own printer, and just eliminate reselling entirely. Like, sorry, if you buy the tickets and can't use them, gift them, or it is what it is. Like, um, I don't, I don't know, you know, because at least then, like, if you wanted to gift it, and I know that to gift it, you'd have to change names, so you'd have to figure that out. But like, um, maybe if you just try to eliminate reselling entirely, it's a live event. Maybe it just needs to be different than other things. And and it's not it, it happens in electronics. People buy at PS fives and then try to resell them. And it happens in lots of things. But maybe just maybe live events just don't get refunds. And so there's no resellers. And so it is what it is. Like you've if you you know, because if you even if you wanted to gift them, make that person show up and say, Hey, this is me, here's my ID, but I'm giving these two tickets to this person. A reseller doesn't have time to do that for every single person. And as soon as they do it more than once, you know, oh, they were just buying multiple tickets to get rid of. Um, I don't know. Maybe you just need to say it is what it is with live events. If you bought the tickets and picked your seats, uh, it's over. You paid your money. Sorry. Yeah. Follow up to the last show that Dylan and I were at at Kemba Live. Mark Rebier was just on Neil Brennan's podcast, Blocks. And if you know anything about Neil's special Blocks or his podcast Blocks, he refers to the mental hangups that we have in our lives as Blocks. And he has his guests come on and talk about what theirs happened to be. This was an idea um, that he was given by, oh, the provocateur British comedian guy. 
Oh, the good looking dapper always dresses up. I, I, yeah, I know who you're talking about. It was his um, idea. He told Neil, he's like, you got to do this because they're buddies. He's like, your special was so good. Have people come on and tell theirs. So Mark Rebier was on Neil's podcast recently. It was really good. Check that out, too. Jimmy Carr. Jimmy Carr. Thank you. Jimmy God. Carr. Yes. Yeah. So they're buddies. And Jimmy was like, yeah, dude, you got to have on people to talk about what their hangups are. So also check out Neil's uh, backlog of those episodes because they're really quite fascinating i think the one that he did um with tom segura was one of my favorite favorites where tom really opens up about weight loss and like sort of what was keeping him back from getting healthier and it's just really like i think it's because you see some of these it's a lot of comics you see these comics and celebrities in a different light where hot ones does that because it's bombarding them with hot sauce right uh yeah. neil just does it organically through deep uh thought-provoking questions and it's it's really good by the way they need to release the outro to that podcast because it's a banger and it's an unreleased track that was made specifically for the show. And I just want to listen to it without having to watch the end of one of Neil's podcasts. Anyway, somebody on YouTube has probably already put that into like 100 hours of this song. Oh, it's it's so good. I, and it, people are asking in every. Every episode, like, who's the track? Where do I get it? And it's just it's unreleased by whatever artist. And so you can't get it anyway. Well, I'm tapped out, gents. You got anything else before we head out? That's it. I think this is a good one. Thanks for cramming us in. The energy felt really good. Maybe there's a lesson to be learned there about not doing them at 10 p.m. Um, so, <laughs> so that was really fun. Thanks for tuning in this week to From the Middle. We just like to have good, fun, silly conversations about things that guys in the middle chapters of life would enjoy talking about. So hopefully we provided that for you this week. Please be sure to check out our sponsor, Artius Man, at artiusman.com. Fill up their cart, your cart rather, with a lot of amazing men's grooming products. And uh, you'll be glad you did because the quality is so great. But you'll really be glad you did when you use promo code THE MIDDLE, all one word, at checkout to get 25% off of your total order. And all subsequent orders will be attached to us. So that helps us. It helps them. It helps you. It's a win, win, win. And we love and celebrate it, as Dylan just did if you're following along on YouTube. Uh, hit us up on all the socials, comment, ask questions. There's a phone number in our link, link tree if you want to leave us a voicemail about anything we've discussed on previous episodes or suggest topics. We'll still answer your questions. If you have questions for us, we love doing that. Uh, and a segment that we call Answers from the Middle. I think that's it. Bye.